Okay. What kind of bird can lift heavy objects? What kind of bird can lift heavy objects? A crane. Come on. What do you call a cat that likes lemons? A sourpuss. Nicely done. What does a nosy pepper do? A nosy pepper. It gets all up in your business. Very well done. I don't even think we need a lecture today. You guys are ready for Monday. What's happening Monday? Exam one. Where's exam one? Right here. If you're in the back row, what are you going to do Monday? Not be in the back row. It's pretty easy. We'll remind you. We'll be nice about it. <clears throat> How many questions? 50. How many on the screen? Five. Test packet, Scantron. Turn your phones off. No talking. No cheating. No using notes. Okay, it's a closed book, closed notes, by yourself kind of standard classic exam. One, one second, um, Sloan, one second. So <clears throat> in this class, you have chapter quizzes online. You can use your textbook. You can look. They're not even timed. You've got participation points that we, we made available on uh, Monday. You're going to want to stay the whole time. We're going to have a bonus opportunity today. We've got more participation points. In fact, you just need to attend one of the following four. You ready? Tonight, 6 to 7 by Zoom, Caitlin, one of the TAs, is going to be offering a review session. Tomorrow, 4 to 5 p.m., Elena, our SI, in Science Annex 122. Jenna, Friday by Zoom, 2 to 3 p.m. Jenna and Caitlin together as a team effort on Sunday, 1 to 2 in the afternoon, bio 256. I will post these tonight so you have them. You go to one of those four, and you will get five more participation points. Pretty straightforward. Okay? Just one of those four. Two of them are on Zoom, two in person, one's on the weekend. And it's all to help you study. Come with your questions. They'll have some activities. Did you have a mo modification? I'm so sorry. That changed since yesterday. <laughs> OK, OK. This just in, Sunday, Jenna, Caitlin, and Elena will be present. 1 to 2, Bio 256. OK? Pretty amazing resources. <clears throat> You've got bonus opportunities, participation points. Live lecture, eh, maybe that's not so great. Recorded lectures, study guides, people seeing the study guides and the resources that are already posted. The exams, yes, they're tough. Show of hands again. How many are going on to school after college? Show of hands, let me see. Raise them high. Guess what they're going to do? Exams. And they're going to be closed book exams. And how many chances do you get on those exams? One. So, yes, it's tough. The material's tough. The exams are challenging. If you don't study, it's not going to be fun on Monday. But if you take advantage of all these things, we're trying to help train you for your future, right? And so the only real way to do that, if you're running a 100-meter event, right, what do you practice? A 100-meter event, right? You don't do 10 meters and be like, yeah. It's just 10 times that, no big deal, right? You, you practice like the real thing. So this is a challenging course. We're trying to give you as many resources as we can. And, and, and that's part of it's a partnership. Like, you, you got to meet us there, OK? <clears throat> so I know some of you are going to say, I cannot make any of, the part, any of the study sessions that you just mentioned. I'm going to request that you talk to whatever the conflict is and find one out of the four that you can sneak away for one hour. Whether that's a boss, 
at a job or, or an, another professor, say, hey, I've got a big exam on Monday. I've heard this guy is really tough, and I want to be prepared for it. And this is part of my future. This is what I want to do. So could I like, get a free pass on Thursday because I need to be out early from work? Or Sunday, can I work the morning shift instead of the afternoon shift so I can be there from what? Does that, so some of this is going to be on you to try to figure that part out. And we've got four opportunities for you to, to get five more participation ports. But more importantly, four opportunities for you to actually have a study session from students, former students that have actually taken this class, sat where you're sitting, and know the style of questions and how I'm going to ask them. Make sense? OK, cool. Any questions about that? All right, <clears throat> let me look at my list. Exam one details. Quiz four is due Friday by 11.59 p.m. Quiz four, it's gonna be over this chapter <clears throat> on histology. Um, bonus today, jokes, I already told the jokes, check. Um, okay. <clears throat> Talked about participation points. Okay, I think we're good. Any other questions before we get going? So I, I'm going to let you guys know I'm actually going to be a little unavailable Friday and Saturday. I will try to check emails tomorrow. I'll be traveling, and Sunday I'll be traveling back. But Friday and Saturday I'm going to be, like, off the grid. So I won't be readily available. But Sunday before the exam and even Monday, <clears throat> um, I will probably on Monday find a time slot to have an office hour is a last minute opportunity by Zoom. Make it as easy as possible, okay? Monday. I better write that down. One second. Okay. <clears throat> we good? We ready? So I have to back up a couple of slides. I just want to make sure, uh, I think it was this one. Where are you? One of your, one of your colleagues pointed this out to me. I'm trying to find you. You're supposed to remind me, by the way, but I wrote it down. OK, so on this slide, what was the green arrow pointing to? What type of fiber? That one's elastin. Collagen is the red, the big bundle, and it's kind of this pink. Remember, uh, collagen is like a strand of how many fibers? Three woven together, right? So it's thicker. Elastin is kind of the squiggly one, and this is reticular fiber right here. I think I might have mixed that up on Monday, so I wanted to clarify that. Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to talk about different types of connected tissue. We're going to finish out our lecture today on the histology and tissues. And <clears throat> this is going to kind of set the stage for lab. And in some of this, I can describe some of the features. I can, I can characterize some of the attributes. But at the end of the day, a lot of this is memorization, OK? So <clears throat> we're going to go through this stuff. We'll have a couple of practice questions at the end. And then, and then your, your bonus opportunity is going to be based upon like histology identification. So do you think there's going to be some histology on the exam on Monday? Yes. Is it going to be a slide that you've seen? Yes. Is it taken from lecture or maybe your bonus opportunity? Yes. So is it a good idea to kind of pay attention? Yes. Connective tissue. The largest group of tissue in the body is connective tissue. And we've got a couple of different types. We've got loose, it's loosely organized, and we have dense. Connective tissue is made up of cells or sites. We call them, typically in generic terms, fibroblasts. And 
All but bone, bone, blood, and cartilage have these fibroblasts. Bone, blood, and cartilage have unique cells that float in them. So a connective tissue is going to be matrix rich or matrix poor? A connective tissue, that's a question for you. Is it matrix rich or is it matrix poor? It's matrix rich. That means it has lots of matrix per cells. Epithelial tissue was the opposite. Do you remember that? Epithelial tissue had a lot of cells in low matrix, high cell pack. So if we look at some examples, this is a type of loose connective tissue known as areolar connective tissue. Areolar, like it looks airy. So take a peek at this. Observe some of the features. You can see cells that are sitting within the matrix. Those are those pink dots. Do you see them? Kind of through the background. And what structures do you think are these fibrils that are like pink bundles? What kind of protein do you think that is? Any guesses? What does it look like? I kind of pointed it out on that slide that I was clarifying. Collagen. But it's a loose architecture, a loose arrangement of fibrous proteins. It has a high gel component. Remember that gel, the proteoglycan? Do you remember that? The glycosaminoglycans, the proteoglycan. What was the function of the proteoglycan molecule? What does it do in tissue? Who can tell us? You can look back at your notes. That's fine. You can't look back on Monday, so look now. What does that proteoglycan do? If I say there's a lot of gel or there's a high proteoglycan content, what is its function? What does that do for the tissue? It attracts sodium, <clears throat> remember, because it's a sugar protein. It's negatively charged. It attracts a positive Na+, sodium. Sodium binds to it. What does water do? Follows, very well described over there. So it hydrates your tissue. It's found under epithelium, around blood vessels. It's the bulking agent. The leukocytes, white blood cells, can actually move through this readily. You can see it looks like a sieve. A different type of loose connective tissue, adipose, fat. Your textbook describes it as like a bundle of balloons all kind of bunched together. They have a very white open space. In fact, in lab meeting, Today, we were looking at adipose tissue in wounds because they're, they're kind of the first primordial matrix that's laid down when you're healing a wound in the skin. And you can learn a lot <clears throat> about skin wound based on the presence of adipocytes or fat cells. <clears throat> they store a lot of energy. There's nothing in the middle. The nucleus is pressed up against the side. They're a vacuole or an open space. <clears throat> they look like a sparse areolar matrix, not as well organized as the previous slide. They generally come from fibroblasts. That's why you find a lot of them in skin when it's healing. They typically do not divide. You replicate them, make them from scratch. They're found under subcutaneous tissue. They're around vessels and organs. They're very rich in stem cells. This question mark is, yes. Are they rich in stem cells? They're a huge source of stem cells. In fact, there's a whole industry in clinical practice around adipose transplantation, like fat transplants. You can actually harvest from liposuction fat stem cells that come out of the fat from the same patient and utilize them in regenerative medicine in other locations joint spaces and wounds for plastic surgery applications, reconstructive surgery applications. <clears throat> so they increase in size when they're mature, and they, they don't necessarily divide. You make new ones. And they also don't die. So if you have a fat cell and you took the energy to make the fat cell and you're going to empty it, they shrivel up. But then they're readily available to store the energy the next time they come around. So that's one of the challenging things about fat cells is they don't disappear 
when you empty them, okay? There's a whole field now in plastic surgery on liposuction because of that. If you remove them surgically or under vacuum, then obviously they go away. Reticular connective tissue, third type of loose connective tissue. Do you see how open these are? Now, if I compare and contrast to more dense connective tissue in a minute, you'll see the differences. Um, we're going to show dense connective tissue here in just a second. But loose connective tissue, the third type, reticular, it's areolar-like, air-like, with a fine meshwork of collagen fibers, <clears throat> and allows for lymphoid tissues to exist, like in the spleen. Compare and contrast these three different types of loose connective tissue with dense connective tissue. We're going to show a, a couple of types. Here's one, here's one, and here's one. Okay, so look at the architecture in comparison to these three that are more air-like. Do you see the differences between loose and dense? So now we're dense, regular connective tissue, high collagen content, so it's very strong. Tendons, ligaments are made up of dense, regular connective tissue. Remember, they're poorly vascularized, but they have a tremendous amount of matrix as a connective tissue. They resist stretching in a single uniaxial plane. So if a tendon's fibers are going this way, <clears throat> or a ligament fiber are going this way, it's very strong in this direction. What about this direction? Not so much. That's why you have an anterior cruciate ligament and a posterior cruciate ligament, right? That means anterior cross, posterior cross. That's what that terminology means, or front cross, back cross, because they form a cross. And they're strong in those directions. But you do a lateral movement, and that's where they tear. Design flaw? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but we see a lot of ACL, PCL uh, tears in the field. They're poorly vascularized, so they don't heal well. So you'll typically replace them. You can repair them, but if it's a full tear, you have to replace it. You can replace it with a cadaver, ligament, or tendon. You can replace it from uh, the same patient. Let's take the patellar tendon. There are synthetics. There's all sorts of variations of, of how you want to do this. It looks a lot like smooth muscle, but without the nuclei. Some students that are doing research say it looks like a Western blot. Anybody, anybody in, in research doing protein stains? Western blot columns kind of look like this. But you can appreciate the direction of the fibers are from left to right. So it's going to be strong from left to right. It's going to be very weak in the up and down direction. Dense, regular connective tissue. Regular because they're parallel fibers. Question, dense, irregular connective tissue. Do you think it's strong in one direction or many directions? Dense, irregular connective tissue. Many directions. So why aren't tendons and ligaments made of these? Why aren't tendons and ligaments made of dense, irregular connective tissue? Allows tension in many planes. I have no idea. That's a great question that I don't have the answer for. But that seems like a better design feature in my opinion. So put that one. I don't have all the answers, folks. I don't know the answer to that one. <clears throat> Allows tension in many planes. Do you see the plane architecture? I mean, it's circular in some. It goes up and to the right, up and to the left. You know, this one actually goes this direction. This one goes that direction. So it's multi-axial strength. Now, everything else that we're going to look at, well, let me tell you where these are found. Joint capsules, dermis of the skin, underneath the skin, very strong, the dermis. The epidermis is the top layer. The dermis is just underneath that. Dense, irregular connective tissue. F found around the aorta. Not found around tendons and ligaments. Not sure why. Seems like it would have been a good idea. Everything else now, connective tissue, that we're going to look at are going to have what we call lacunae or caves, spaces that house cells. So we look at cartilage. Like tendons and ligaments, no blood supply. 
or very, very low blood supply. So in cartilage, there's actually two different types of cartilage. There's one that's called white cartilage and one that's called red cartilage. And the red cartilage is slightly vascularized, and that's why it can repair to some extent. But if you have a full tear of the cartilage, typically you won't get regeneration. Question? It's a great question. I will repeat it for the recording. So if someone's quote unquote double jointed or they, you know, really what that terminology means is they have hypermobility in a particular joint. So the question is, would they have dense irregular connective tissue found in their tendons and ligaments in those joints? Not that I have ever seen. So the mobility of the joint is such and embryologically as it would develop, it, you can hyperextend, you can overextend. The ligaments and the tendons were growing and developing in utero to support that motion. So it's built for the support of that hypermobility, right? But they still could um, tear. Um, they may not tear as easily because they have a bigger range of motion than, than maybe you or I, okay? That help? Yeah. Good question. So with the no nerve and no blood supply, <clears throat> we, uh, we tear a cartilage and you'll have pain because of the surrounding tissue. You'll have inflammation of the surrounding tissue that gives a pain response, but the cartilage itself you can't actually feel. And it's not vascularized very well, except for red, but for the most part, it doesn't regenerate very well. It has a perichondrium, peri meaning outer covering, which is a dense uh, layer of irregular connective tissue that surrounds the cartilage of developing bone. So it has a capsule that's pretty strong but the cartilage itself is not. This picture on the right is hyaline cartilage, and <clears throat> it has parallel lines on the left, and then these lacunae, or the chondrocytes, they look like these little eyes. The lacunae is a Latin word that means cave or space. And so the chondrocytes live within these lacunae, and the chondrocytes are what manufacture the matrix known as cartilage. Chondrocytes make the cartilage. They surround the outside environment with product of, of car cartilaginous protein. Now we've got um, different types. <clears throat> um, highland cartilage. <clears throat> this was an example of a highland cartilage sample. These two are both examples of highland cartilage, just with different what? Stains. You can see the nomenclature here of the lacunae, which is the space that this arrow is pointing to, and then the chondrocyte that lives within it. It's this sort of white inner circle that's living within that space. With hyaline cartilage, it looks white on appearance through dissection. It's glassy. It's gristly. It's the most abundant cartilage. It's found on the trachea, which is the windpipe holds open the windpipe so it doesn't collapse as you exhale and inhale. The tip of the nose, costal cartilage, like between the, the, the ribs and attaching to the rib uh, sternum, and the ends of long bones, hyaline cartilage, the ends of long bones. It's the most abundant. It's about 40% makeup collagen, the strongest protein. Elastic cartilage, more stretchy, more elastin than hyaline cartilage. More elastin by nature, the red arrows are pointing to these kind of black squiggly lines. Do you remember in the, the sample in the very beginning of lecture that I went back from last week and looked at? And I showed you the elastin, the reticular fiber versus the collagen. The collagen is the big bundle. The elastin fiber is kind of the black squiggly line. You see a lot of elastin in elastic cartilage, hence the name. External ear, elastin. Look how well it snaps back, right? I mean, most of us that sleep on our side, you wake up, I mean, your ear would be like, right, if there was an elastic cartilage. Uh, the epiglottis that divides or partitions the nasopharynx, the back of the throat, oropharynx, nasopharynx, 
to move food down the uh, esophagus and air down the trachea. Fibrocartilage, last one. So we have hyaline, elastic, and fibro. Less firm than hyaline, so there's less collagen. It's more compressible or deformable. And it provides a linker between hyaline and dense regular connective tissue in the body. So it's used where you need compression and strength because it's, it'll deflect a little bit more. It's not really elastic like the ear, but you're going to find it between the intervertebral discs in your spine, right, where you get a lot of compression. You'll find it um, at the pubic symphysis, where you have the joining of the two ox coxa that make up your hip, and the pubic symphysis is like that point in your growing where those two bones, bones come together. But it takes all the weight of the head, arms, and trunk onto your hips, or what we call your pelvic girdle. And so that interface takes a lot of weight. That's a lot of compressive force, just like the vertebral column. The menisci of the, dis, of the knees. How many have torn a meniscus? Yeah, you tore fibrocartilage. Didn't hold up. Do you see the wavy lines? Do you see how it's more regular in appearance? It's going to be strong from upper left to lower right, but from upper right to lower left in this direction, it's going to tear. The knee discs, the menisci, are made up of fibrocartilage. So you see this wavy appearance in fibro. So let's just back up. Hyaline, this is hyaline. These two are hyaline. Kind of the frog eyes, or frog eggs, the fish googly eyes. Here you got elastic with the elastin fibers. And then here you have fibro, which is like wavy collagen lines for knee meniscus, um, pubic symphysis, and intervertebral disc. So part of the answer to the question I posed is, why isn't the cartilage in your knee um, you know, I asked about tendons and ligaments. Uh, there's a lot of compression on those. And menisci have a lot of compression. And so you're trading the strength on compression for the side effect of being weak in one direction, right? So that's kind of really the answer. But I still think it's a design potential flaw, I'm not trying to be rude about it. But I think uh, it would have been interesting maybe to mix the two. Like, what if you had tendons, ligaments, ligaments, and fibrocartilage that had uh, both. It, it was strong, right, in one direction with organized collagen fibers, and then every now and then you had cross-hatching or alternating parallel lines in intersecting lines. I think that would have been interesting, but something for another conversation. Okay, so bone. Bone is a type of connective tissue. So we've talked about tendons, ligaments, We've talked about cartilage, a lot of matrix, fewer cells, bone. Bone is a connective tissue? Absolutely. It's matrix rich, cell poor. There's more extracellular matrix stuff. You remember the protein factory question that I posed in class? I posted the answer on Canvas. Making products in the cell. The cell can choose to put certain things inside the cell like actin. It can excrete other things outside the cell. Bone cells do the exact same thing. They're called osteocytes. Osteo for bone, site for cell. It's like cartilage. We've got two main types. We've got cancellous and trabecular. Trabecular has another name um, referred to as, um, I'm sorry, cancellous has three names, cancellous, trabecular, or spongy. Osseous has three names, osseous, cortical, or compact. Why are there three names? I don't know. I will try not to confuse you, but cancellous, trabecular, and spongy have like an open architecture. Osseous, cortical, or compact is just like it sounds. It's actually more dense. There's a bone mineral known as hydroxyapatite, and 
this is one of the main consistencies of our bony matrix. It has a very special blood arrangement in the bone. If you cut bone with a bone saw in a patient, it bleeds like crazy. It's extremely well vascularized. If you cut your skin, it bleeds like crazy, right? Extremely well vascularized. Those two tissues heal very well. How many of you are going to be dental hygiene or dentistry? You cut anything in the mouth, it actually heals really well because it's very well vascularized, right? You've got bony maxilla and mandible, like those are the jaw lines. They're full of bone. They're very well vascularized. You do like third molar extractions, wisdom teeth. They bleed like crazy. You got to pack them so they clot. You cut the gum as a periodontist, it bleeds. You're a, a, a dental hygienist, you're cleaning teeth, and they always tell you what? I see a lot of bleeding. Are you flossing, right? So the, the gingiva bleeds really, really well. So oral lesions heal very quickly. Skin heals very quickly. Bones heal very quickly. Cartilage, not so much. Tendons, ligaments, not so much. There was a question over here, I thought. Yeah. So, you Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. So, you're talking about a very specific patient situation. You're talking about a patient that has blood cancer, which is what leukemia is. And if, if they're going to drill into the hip, um, it's typically because they're doing a marrow transplant. Right? They're going to probably try to find a donor, borrow the bone marrow, which we'll talk about in a second, which is where a lot of the stem progenitor cells for blood come from. So your red blood cells and your white blood cells, the red blood cells circulate in your bloodstream to carry oxygen. The white blood cells become leukocytes, which fight infection and basically give you immunity. If you have a leukemia then you have an infection at typically the bone marrow of cancer and you're not making your white blood cell counts drop. And so you're at risk of infection. Now you're compromised immunologically and wound healing is an immunological process. <clears throat> Secondly, um, they, they intentionally try to leave those spots open. So if they need to do another transplant, they can. Because getting access to the bone marrow is pretty invasive, it's not fun. I, I mean, it's, you basically drill into the bone marrow. And, and then you have a, a, a monster gauge needle that comes in to deliver the, the marrow. Um, and you know, so that, that kind of you know, supports a couple of reasons as to why it, it doesn't really heal real well. Uh, but also, a lot of times, they'll try to keep it access open for like a, you know, a future infusion if necessary. Okay? Special arrangement. Uh, this, it doesn't work on this screen. I, I'll learn that at some point in this semester. Uh, these screens are new. I, special ar arrangement. So what was the diffusion distance of oxygen? Do you guys remember that question that I posed in a lecture? That question won't be on the exam, but it's just kind of one of those curious facts. Okay, I won't ask that question on the exam. What's the diffusion distance of oxygen? But I may ask the question about vascularized versus avascularized, and I just want you to appreciate why we have certain architecture of the vasculature. So bone is like any other tissue, and the diffusion distance of oxygen is about 200 to 250 microns. And so this is bone. It, it, you know, you, do you remember the old school number two pencils? You put like a bundle of them, and you put a rubber band, and then look down, look down like this. That's what you're doing here. And so this pencil is coming out at you, and this is the lead. And that's the central canal of the osteon, that's the main blood vessel that's coming out at the picture. So you're looking at it top down view. Make sense? And then here's another one. And then here's another one. And here's another one. And here's another one. So those are like those bundle of pencils that are all together. And the central canal from each one of these is no further away than that diffusion distance from each other. And so when you grow new bone, like during childhood and even in adolescence, and our bone is remodeling all the time. We'll talk about this. It's called Wolf's Law. We'll talk about it in uh, Unit 2. 
it remodels every day based upon the forces that are put on it. And so it remodels, meaning you got certain cells that lay down new bone, which are called osteoblasts, other cells that um, break down the bone, they're called osteoclasts, and they move and make new osteons, and then they take them away. And when they reconstruct and deconstruct every single day, they're following this diffusion distance pattern because you have to make sure that those osteocytes are getting oxygen. Make sense? That's the special arrangement in um, bone. Central blood vessel, and you have connections between, known as cannuliculi. And they're between these lacunae, just like cartilage, which is the little cave where the osteocyte lives. Osteocyte is a mature cell, and osteoblast is an immature cell laying down bone matrix, and osteoclast is the one that breaks it down. And we'll talk more about that in unit two. So cancellous bone. Remember, cancellous bone is trabecular or spongy. It's going to be more open. Cancellous, trabecular, um, spongy bone. It looks like a sponge. It has a lot of openings or spaces. You've got, we showed this picture a couple lectures ago where I had the adipose tissue labeled where these open vacuoles, and then I have the trabeculae, which is a strut of bone, solid bone, but you can see that it's not just all this solid pink stain. Here's a strut, 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 here's a strut that kind of looks like a A, and in between it is open space. And the trabeculae are the struts of bone, that's why it's called trabeculated bone. The open space gives it the spongy appearance, that's why we call it spongy bone. And cancellus is just from kind of the Greek root, name-wise. Bone marrow lives around and with surrounding these adipocytes. So the bone marrow that we're talking about in these bone marrow transplants, primarily in the long bones of the body, like arms and legs, is where you're going to find the stem cells. Remember that I talked about adipose tissue as a connective tissue that had a lot of stem cell population? That's what's packed in the trabeculae bone or spongy bone that gives it its progenitor stem consistency. And it changes over time. As we age, it actually gets more yellow and less regenerative, like in geriatric patients. In younger patients, it's extremely regenerative. And that's one of the reasons that we don't live forever, right? Okay, this is a picture of uh, compact bone. Compact bone, more solid. You see compact bone right down the center. This, oh, th this space here, you know, I'll talk about these two in a second, but very different than here. You have a strut of bone here, but here you have a solid sheet of bone. Well, on the left, lower left side, these are osteoclasts. They're multinucleated. That means they have many, this one has like four nuclei. This one has at least three. This one has two. This one has like five. Do you see how these are multinucleated and they're big? And they act like macrophages. They're actually chewing up the bone. So their activity is chewing up the bone from here to here. And this is the edge of the bone that they're digesting. On this side are osteoblasts. They're uninucleated and they're building bone in this direction. And you're like, why on earth would you do that? Why would you spend all this energy breaking down bone and building bone in the same sample, in the same tissue? Because our bone is a storage facility for a lot of um, compounds like calcium and hydroxyapatite. And calcium homeostasis in our body is really important. And it's used for all sorts of different types of functions. Like, so for example, we'll get into muscle contraction later in the semester. Muscle contraction only happens if calcium is present inside the muscle cell. And then to relax the muscle, you have to get rid of the calcium. Move it out of the way. So you can't have calcium just sticking around in a muscle cell. Otherwise, you'll just be like frozen and have tetany. You won't be able so to relax your muscles. You have to move the calcium out of the cell, sequester it, and to contract the muscle, you actually have to make it available. 
well, where are you going to put all this extra calcium? And we're eating calcium all the time, and we have to manage it so we don't have too much and over, over flood the system. Well, your bony architecture is a great place to store calcium. When calcium levels are low, you make it available. You stimulate osteoclast activity. When you have too much calcium and you need to store it, you stimulate osteoblast activity and put the calcium in the bones. Make sense? So a lot of this homeostasis is based upon that. Now, another fact, how many physical therapists in the future? I saw your hand. I'll get it in a second. Are you going to be a physical therapist, though? Then it's got to go down. Okay. Physical therapy for older patients or post-surgery or bed rest patients. It's really important for our older population to be doing weight-bearing activity. Have you heard that before? And we'll talk about it more in the skeletal system, but this is the reason. If you stimulate weight-bearing activity, you put more force on the bone, you stimulate osteoblasts to build more bone. If you're sedentary and you are bed rest, you're not taking walks around the block, even with a walker or with a cane and you're older, 70 plus, osteoclast activity dominates. Okay, so that's another piece of this equation that's relevant to what we're doing. Okay, what's your question why I minimize this screen and we're going to watch a little video? Incontinence? Yeah, there's a lot of things that impact incontinence in, in patients. Typically, it's, um, so it could either be nerve innervation, it could be um, muscle fatigue or, or uh, inability for muscles to respond. Um, I haven't really heard of it being a, a calcium issue because if it's, if it's a calcium issue for contraction, it would be body-wide, not just in like urinary openings or, you know, anal openings, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But a lot of those muscles that you control, especially like sphincter activity, it becomes less um, tone as you, as you age. I mean, you can see that in patients, right? I mean, there's 75-year-olds don't look like you. <laughs> okay, even if they go to the gym, they'll never look like you, right? Okay. This is a little video that um, kind of displays this remodeling of bone that I'm talking about. The skeleton gains of healthy human lifespan. This is characterized predominantly by bone formation and growth throughout childhood. Followed by a gradual loss of bone density to begin in early adulthood that can accelerate significantly in older adults. The density of bone is modulated by weaker cells including osteoclasts, which are multinucleated cells that resort bone and osteoblasts which repair the resorption patterns created by osteoclasts. Osteoclasts anchor the cell to the surface of bone. This creates a microenvironment underneath the cell, which is referred to as the fluid zone. Multinucleated, you see? Within this zone, the osteoclasts create a thick environment that dissolves the bone's mineral content. Once the mineral content of the bone has been dissolved, enzymes released from osteoclasts remove the remaining collagenous bone matrix to complete the process of resorption. Following resorption, osteoblasts move into the resorption space and start to produce and deposit organic matrix called osteoid. Osteoid, a substance made predominantly of collagen, forms a scaffold in which minerals including calcium and phosphate begin to crystallize. Some active osteoblasts become trapped within the matrix they secrete and thereby become osteocytes. And they live in the lacunae. results in increase in bone mass 
and is referred to as Bones Island. Bones Island promotes the growth of bones <coughs> and is important for maintaining the <coughs> New modern optimization for the lower grade bone growth by optimizing the growing structure. Okay. Okay, that's all I wanted you to see. I think these videos help to kind of put it in motion so you can kind of see what's happening. So there's this constant turnover that's happening with our bones. It's a connective tissue, mostly matrix, but there are important cells there. It's not that when we say it's matrix rich, cell poor, the, pel that the cells aren't important, right? It's just from a ratio standpoint, you have fewer population of cells and more matrix. Questions over the connective tissue stuff so far? Any other questions? Good questions today. I do not mind you all asking questions, by the way. I think it's actually really, really valuable. Yes? Question is about bone modeling versus remodeling. Um, bone modeling is talking about during development or in childhood. And we'll talk more about that during the skeletal system, but once the epiphyseal plates close, your growth plates, and you're done growing, now your bone just remodels. It's not going to get longer, you know, because the plates have actually closed. And, and so kind of foreshadowing, those plates are made up of cartilage. And the cartilage gets replaced by bone, and it extends in both directions. And that's how a long bone gets longer. At some point in an individual's life, for women, it's usually 16 to 18. For men, it can be like 18 to 22. It's a little later. Those plates completely ossify. And there's no more cartilage. They're only bone. And now you're at your terminal height. Okay. There's a birth effect. Uh, Androchronic plasia dwarfism, um, where these are, are individuals that their, arm, their long bones, their arms and their legs never really grow. So they have like childlike arm and leg length, and then they have adult torso and head. And it's called the, the dwarfism, or the technical term is androchronic plasia dwarfism. So remodeling is what's happening post uh, growth plate closure and modeling, bone modeling is what happens during development. There's another question here up front. So the question is with cartilage, when it wears down, and it typically wears down with overuse and age, just time, uh, what happens? Well then unfortunately you start getting what's called bone on bone. And that leads to typically a situation known as um, uh, arthritis, uh, but it's not rheumatoid arthritis. It's called osteoarthritis, which is actually an inflammatory disease that is irritation of the bone hitting the bone because you don't have that cushion anymore. Yeah, so in hypermobility syndrome, um, I don't know of any data that, that shows that their fiber architecture is any different as far as um, irregular or regular, but their fiber density can be less, so they're more loose in the joint space. And so if those fibers that are going in this direction, there's just fewer of them, now you have hypermobility, but you're more prone to tearing. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now I just like opened up Pandora's box here with questions. I love it. Um, with like the other uh, thing, is that just hereditary? Or is it just something that um, you do with arthritis? All right, question is uh, with arthritis, is it hereditary? Is there uh, an injury component, you know, an environmental component? So it can be both. So, so there's a few different types of arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder. Rheumatoid arthritis is you actually 
uh, target a, a particular antigen in your joints and attack it with your immune system. Typically, we believe right now the leading the prevalent theory is it's collagen type 2 that you are attacking. So rheumatoid arthritis is typically bilateral. And that's where you get these pictures of people that have like crooked fingers, crooked f toes. But it's usually on both sides because it's all over. Osteoarthritis is a wear and tear injury, which is different. It's not an autoimmune disorder. It usually happens in older individuals or athletes that have overused something. So it may be a shoulder in a pitcher or an elbow in a pitcher. Um, it may be soccer players on the knees. It could be bilateral because you don't run like this, right? But um, the idea is it's not going to, it'll be the knees only. It may not be the hips. The hips might be fine. The ankles might be fine. With rheumatoid, it usually starts with the small joints and it moves everywhere. So both of those could have a hereditary component, including overuse, because maybe the, the, the way the bones are forming, you know, like it, if you look at your shape, you might look more like mom or you look more like dad, right? Or maybe you're like, I'm the postman kid, right? Or you look more like your uncle or your aunt. Like it's, it's, it, genetics are funny. They skip a generation. Um, so there could be a hereditary component on the way your biomechanics are set up or you're more prone or you have hypermobility. And so those things along with environment can actually stimulate osteoarthritis to happen sooner. Okay. Okay. We'll shift gears um, to blood. Blood is a connective tissue. Like, Right? I, maybe I blew your mind with bone being a connective tissue. Blood ha is a matrix. You're like, what? It's a liquid, Dr. Keller. No, you've seen the matrix after the blood coagulates. It forms a matrix, right? If it didn't, you would exsanguinate and you wouldn't be here. So good thing it forms a solid matrix. You control when the matrix forms. But it is a matrix that cells live in, and it's mostly matrix and it's fewer cells. That's what blood is. It's made up of red blood cells and white blood cells. And the matrix is very specifically designed. So plasma is the main component of blood, and it's a protein, um, albumin, that is the main protein within blood plasma. We kind of mentioned that earlier in the semester. It is a very water-soluble protein, albumin, so it goes into solution very easily. We'll talk more about this in 202, next semester, um, where you explore the cardiovascular system. But I put it in tissues because I want you to appreciate that it's an actual type of connective tissue. All right, now we're moving to muscle and nerve. Muscles and nerve. What do muscles do? Well, they shorten. They contract. They allow for movement, mobility, contraction, closing openings, incontinence we talked about. Um, they contract, so they allow you to formulate words. They allow you to breathe. They allow for locomotion. Muscles do all this stuff. They have a specialization that allows their particular function. We'll look at the muscle physiology section later in the semester, and we'll point back to this introductory unit, right? If you notice, we started on real basic biology and chemistry stuff, and now we're starting to layer the A and P. And then we're going to get really heavy into specific physiology units in unit two. We'll talk about skin as an organ, one of my favorites, because I do a lot of wound healing work. We'll talk about bones, the skeletal system in unit two. And then later, we'll talk about muscles. But they are cell-rich. They're very well vascularized. So, so we did epithelium. We did connective tissue. Now we're on muscles, and then we're going to go to nerve. You with me? So four different categories, making sure you knew that. Epithelium and part of connective tissue was Monday. Connective tissue has been today all the way until now. We ended with blood as the last example of a connective tissue. Now we're in muscles, and we're going to finish out with nerve. And then we're going to talk about some histology pictures. It's extremely well vascularized, so it heals really well. A torn muscle, I mean, you're out maybe a couple of weeks, and it's completely healed. It's pretty amazing. 
Muscle cells are elongated cells. And I'll remind you of that in the muscle physiology section that we talk about later, where it looks very intimidating, but it's just a cell. But instead of a round cell with a dot in the middle that's the nucleus, it's a long cylinder that has many nuclei, if it's skeletal muscle. So they're elongated cells. They have special fibers with cytoskeletal proteins for contraction, like two in particular, actin and myosin. Both of those are cytoskeletal proteins that are organized in a specific architecture in muscle cells. They're found in all cells. Actin and myosin are in all cells, but they're organized very uniquely in muscle cells. We have three types, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal, voluntary control. Attaches to bones via tendons, which we kind of covered already. They're elongated. This is histology, a hematoxylin and eosin stain section. This is a single cell. And this one, here's a nucleus here, here's a nucleus here, here's a nucleus here. Skeletal muscle is multinucleated, just like that osteoclast that we looked at. It's striated. Do you see kind of how it has these striations or these ribs? What you're seeing there is the pattern of actin and myosin intracellular cytoskeletal proteins that are organized very specifically because what they do is they slide across each other and that's actually how you contract. And then they slide back and that's how you relax the muscle. So when you want to take a drink of water, you contract the biceps, shorten it, those, those filaments slide across each other, and then you relax it to set it down and they elongate. That's the striations and that's the whole purpose. Cardiac muscle, muscle of the heart, it's under involuntary control. You don't think like beat, 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 exam on Monday, beat, 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 right? It's just under involuntary control. Now, of course, there are individuals that can meditate, think through, have a little bit more biofeedback. They feel their heart rhythm. They can slow it down. They can speed it up, right? But generally speaking, it's under involuntary control, meaning... You sleep at night, you don't have to worry about, you know, is my heart still running? Unless you have a cardiac problem. Uninucleated, but they're branched. So they kind of look a little bit like skeletal muscle. This is just oriented up and down. This one's oriented side to side. But do you see like this branching pattern? And they're only single nuclei. And they have these connections between one cell and the other known as an intercalated disc. That's this line right here. And that is an electrical connection that tells the cardiac muscle next to the other one to contract after this one contracts. So that your heart actually beats. Your heart embryo embryologically is a blood vessel. It's a tube. And then during development in utero, it folds into a U. And then it kind of pinches off and forms valves. And that's how you get two upper chambers and two lower chambers. It's a tube that's like this that you fold up and then it kind of fuses. So <clears throat> it's important if you think through like flow in 202, you'll look at blood flow through the heart, but think about a tube. And you want to have, you have a, a, a long tube and you have fluid in it and you want to squeeze fluid from this side to that side. What do you do? You squeeze here, here, like this, right? And that's how the heart contracts. Is it, it contracts in synchrony, but you're moving it from the, left, uh, the right ventricle to the lungs, back to the heart, to the left side, from the atrium to the ventricle, and then out to the body. So it's just a series of contractions that has to be in synchrony, because if you want to move fluid through a tube, you don't squeeze here and then randomly squeeze in the middle and randomly squeeze over there, right? That's heart palpitations or irregular rhythm. You need a pacemaker to control when the synchrony happens. The intercalated discs help for all that to take place, this squeezing motion. Okay, so just specialized muscle. That's it. Last one in the muscle category, and then we'll go to nerve. Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, involuntary control. This is on openings, like the anus, the urinary tract, the... Um, Lower esophageal sphincter. It's the bottom of the, of, of the throat, top of the stomach. 
keeps food in the stomach that you've swallowed. If that sphincter becomes loose as you age, you get a lot of regurgitation up the lower esophageal sphincter. You cause stomach acid to come up the esophagus. It burns right around the heart. We call it heartburn, right? Or, ass, or uh, stomach uh, 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 reflux. Smooth muscle, slow sustained contractions. Uh, peristaltic motions, like you swallow food. You swallow a bolus of food. It's that tube of toothpaste example or the tube of fluid where you're squeezing behind to move it from the mouth down. And it, it's called peristaltic motion where you're squeezing in a regular pattern. But it's slow, so the food moves slowly. Moving food through the digestive tract, smooth muscle. You eat something, it takes 8 to 12 hours before it comes out. And it moves through the alimentary canal in a slow fashion with that kind of squeezing motion, just really slow. Why, why go slow? So you have time to absorb the nutrition as the food is breaking down in the body. Uninucleated, they're in fusiform form, which is, fusiform just means like spindle-like. So it's kind of fat in the middle and then skinny on top, skinny on the bottom. That's fusiform. And you don't have visible striations. You have striations in cardiac and in skeletal, but in smooth, you don't see visible striations. They're organized very, very differently. Still have actin and myosin, but they're organized more in a network, like a, like a fishnet, versus actually like striated patterns. Okay, last tissue that we need to cover, and stick around, we've got a little time because i got some stuff for you. Nervous tissue, two main types of nervous tissue. So we talked about epithelial, we talked about connective, we talked about, um, uh, what was the third, oh, muscle, and now we're talking about nervous tissue, the four different types of tissue. Neurons and glial cells. We showed this picture before earlier. What's the big cell in the middle? You forgot? What is this big cell in the middle? Any guesses? You had a 50-50 chance. Huh? Neuron. Well done. Someone took a leap. Neuron, right? So if you see that on the exam, you won't miss it now. What about these little satellite smaller cells? Those are all glial cells. Glial cells outnumber neurons in nervous tissue 9 to 1. They're supporting cells. The neurons get all the attention. They send and receive information. They transmit the electricity. The glial cells are supporting neurons. They're smaller. They're the understudy. They're much more numerous, and there's more types of them. They help with nutrition to the neuron. They remove waste products. They help with damage in the tissue, kind of cleaning up the debris, what we call those microglial cells. You've actually heard of different types of lesions and diseases, like a patient has a stroke, a cerebral stroke, neurons die, electrical signals can't be sent, they lose muscle coordination, muscle activity, um, support muscles in the face, they have a droopy side because they had a stroke on, on the right side, so the left hemisphere, or right hemisphere had a stroke, the left side of the body is actually paralyzed. We'll talk more about that in the nervous section. <clears throat> but glial cells, glioblastoma is a cancer that's very lethal, that's a cancer of glial cells and not neurons. So these are, these are all the different cell types that you see in the body. Questions over the different types of tissue? Okay, I wanna go through a couple of slides of practice. You can write down the answers. These are on your PowerPoints. They'll be in the lecture. We're gonna go relatively quick. You can refresh yourself on this practice. What is this tissue that's between the two arrows? 
Someone shout it out for me. Simple squamous. Very good. Single, simple. It's a flat cell. How about this one? What is this tissue? We've got three types of cartilage, two types of connective tissue. Let me ask you this. Is this fat? Is this adipose tissue? No. Is it a cartilage? No. Areolar connective tissue. See how I did that? I kind of eliminated some. I'm like, I know that's not fat because fat's like the balloons, right? What about this one? What's a feature you could focus on that's, I, that's clearly unique? The cilia. Well done. So which one is ciliated always? Pseudostratified epithelium. Very good. Cilia on this one? No, no cilia. Are they squamous? The cuboidal? They look like cubes? Are they columns? Yeah. What kind of tissue is it? Simple columnar. Now, where would you find it? That's where I'm asking is, but first you have to figure out what it is, but if you're, right? That's why we went down that path. So where are you going to find simple columnar? Gastrointestinal lining, very well done. Lining of the kidney tubules is the, the, the cuboidal. You remember the cuboidal in a circle? Epidermis, squamous, right? Covering an organ? What kind of tissue is covering an organ? Heart, yellow color when you open the chest. What is that? Fat, remember? Reinforcing a joint capsule. Cartilage, tendon, or a ligament, right? Okay. How about this one? What is it? This one's reticular connective tissue. Reticular connective tissue. A lot of elastin. What is this one? Is it a single layer? No, it's multiple layers. So is it simple or stratified? Stratified. Stratified cuboidal or they look like columns? Columns. Stratified columnar. What are the small black fibers? Elastin. Anytime a small black squiggly fiber, it's elastin. Major functions of the tissue. Well, first, what, what is the tissue? Let's start there. Are they in all sorts of different directions, so it's irregular? No. Is it organized in a regular pattern? I would say so. Probably strong in one direction, weak in another, don't you think? Which way is it weak? Side to side or up and down? Up and down. Up and down. Does that make sense? Okay. Looks like, I mean, I think your book kind of shows stuff like this, like lasagna layers and things like that, right? So dense regular connective tissue is what it is. I think you guys got there. What does it do? What's a dense regular connective tissue that looks like that? What's its function? Does it look like muscle that's going to move stuff through the digestive tract? No. Does it look like skin? That's what protects the body from the external environment. No. Absorption of nutrients? Single layer, right? No. Does it look like bone? Storing calcium? No. Connect bone to bone? You think it's a tendon or a ligament? I would say so. Fits the bill. Are you guys kind of catching on how the structure helps you determine what the heck it does? Okay. What is this one? Hmm, this one's hard. This one's a little challenging. We talked about it. It's a very unique type of tissue. Transitional. Well done. Where do you find it? Bladder? Okay. What are these? Oh, they're funny colored. Keller, I never saw orange. L means lumen. Big open vacuole space for storage of 
adipose tissue. Okay, how about this? An immature cell in this would be called what? Fibroblast. Well done. This is fibrocartilage. Right? Fibrocartilage was kind of the wavy, kind of look like a little bit reminiscent of this one, right? But cartilage. Okay, what about this one? What is it? Does it look like cardiac? Does it look like skeletal? Can you see striations? You can? I don't see striations. This one's smooth. That one's, you have striations in that one? Striations in that one? Yeah. This one has specialized arrows po pointing at, arrows pointing at specialized lines. What is that one? Cardiac. That one doesn't have those. What's that one? Skeletal. I skipped one. What's this? It's a neuron. What part of the neuron am I pointing to? The dendrite. Very good. Okay, how about this one? This one's challenging. It's either smooth muscle or it could be dense regular connective tissue, right? This one happens to be smooth muscle. <clears throat> Dense regular connective tissue doesn't have that many nuclei. It's kind of the big difference. Okay, two more. What is that? Structure. The circle within the cell. Nucleus. Okay, last one. What is it? Simple or stratified? Stratified. Those are cubes, stratified cuboidal. Okay, hold tight. You're going to want to take a picture of this next slide. There's a bonus opportunity prior to exam one. Are you ready? You're going to need this code. <clears throat> 